Okay, good morning. Today we're going to talk about the four-stroke cycle. What do you guys know about a four-stroke engine? Nothing. Just four strokes. Four strokes. Do we know what those four strokes are? Yes. Yes? Care to share? No. Okay, what's so four strokes, intake, exhaust, compression, combustion. Do we know what order they go in? Does any of this make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the first stroke is the intake stroke. On the intake stroke, we're drawing air into the combustion chamber. The way this works is very simple. Okay, the piston comes down, one valve is going to open, that is the intake valve. What that does is allows air to come in through vacuum. Okay, so as the piston comes down, we're pulling air in. We're creating vacuum. We're getting fuel in at the same time. On 90% of the engines we deal with, the fuel will come in with the intake. Newer engines now, fuel is actually injected directly into the combustion chamber, uh, which is another story for another day that we may or may not even get into this year. Uh, the second stroke is the compression stroke. So that's the piston coming back up. Both valves are closed. If we had an open valve, we can't build pressure. So both valves are closed. We're compressing the air mixture. You can see in this image, as rotation, this is going up, we're compressing everything. Both valves are closed. Do we know what's going to happen next? We squished it. Uh, the spark plug is going to The spark plug is going to fire, again, on most engines. On a diesel engine, we don't have a spark plug. But basically, combustion is going to happen next. Uh, and generally speaking, by spark plug. Do we know how a diesel engine combusts? Uh, it just takes compressed really much and explodes. That's right, we squish it until it blows up. Um, which again, that's another story for another day. We'll probably get into that a little bit later. Um, but we're gonna have a spark after we build pressure. That's your power stroke, your combustion stroke. Uh, basically, it says the piston is going down. The piston is actually being forced down by the pressure. So that's where your power stroke comes from. That combustion throws that piston down and that's where you're getting all of your pressure build. Okay, so from the spark, basically you get a nice smooth burn. Uh, if it ignites too early or too late, um, you get what we either call pre-detonation or uh, post-detonation. Typically, most vehicles, when they start to run rough, you are actually dealing with something called pre-detonation. Um, and that's when it combusts before the piston's at the top. So it's still trying to build pressure, and then you have combustion. It's trying to push that piston down while it's still trying to come back up. Um, and the only way to adjust that, usually you're dealing with valve timing issues, or spark plug issues, things like that, where the spark's actually jumping too early. The fourth stroke of the four-stroke engine is the exhaust stroke. So after, after combustion, we've got all the gases now in that chamber, we just need to get rid of them. So that piston's gonna come back up, the exhaust valve is going to open, and we're just gonna push it back out. The exhaust valve's going to close, the intake valve's gonna open, and we're gonna start all over again. So, then when the piston is at the very top, right before the intake stroke, so you can call it the beginning or you can call it the end of the cycle, whichever you want, um, that is what we call top dead center. So cylinder one, right at the very top of the stroke. Okay, bottom dead center, cylinder one at the very bottom of the stroke. Um, we use these to reference timing. Um, TDC, BDC, you would be advancing timing based on TDC or um, retarding timing based on TDC. So bore are some of the terms that we're gonna use. Um, bore, stroke, do we know what any of this is? Have you seen these terms and anything else? Tyler, what's cylinder bore? Cylinder bore, it's the last one, right? For the Sorry, cylinder bore. Bore? Bore. So, oh, no. Okay, so the diameter of the cylinder. So actually the space where the piston sits inside that combustion chamber, that diameter across is what we call bore. Okay? So 
um, in things like rally cars where they need ground clearance but they still want a low hood line they need something small in there and that's why Subaru's gone to a motor like this um, Volkswagen did it in the 30s uh, because they needed to get it in the back of the car it needed to follow underneath the uh, underneath the trunk lines at the back um, does anybody know who designed the Volkswagen in the 30s Yes. Uh, it, was Hitler. it was on Hitler's request. Yes. So Hitler went to a guy and said, build me a car. The people's car, they called it. Um, that guy was Ferdinand Porsche. So he built the Volkswagen and then he went, hey, I can build cars. And then he built the Porsche. Uh, so basically Hitler's also responsible for the Porsche. <coughs> we'll, we'll blame him for that too. So, uh, Cool design, they use this exact motor, the Volkswagens, uh, from 1936 right up to 1979. Made very, very little changes. Um, carbureted engine, they swapped them over to injection in 75, and they built that engine um, in Mexico right up to 1999, but we couldn't get them here after 79. Um, that's long and short of four stroke. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody learn anything? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Gordon, you look like you want to know something. What do you want to know, my friend? What does compression mean? What does compression mean? So if you take something that is this big and we compress it down, we're making it smaller. We're making it smaller. We're increasing pressure. Um, when you take something and compress it, what else might happen? It breaks oh. or it slows. Why? Because the, the compression rate's too high, like it's too compressed for like the strength. Right, so some it. things will pop, they'll bang, um, they get hot. Anything you compress heats up. So we create heat, when we create pressure, that also helps atomize the fuel coming in, um, creating a nice smooth burn. Tyler. What's the difference between turbocharged, supercharged, and uh, like twin turbo or like naturally aspirated? Okay, so a naturally aspirated engine obviously is what we've just learned. That's your basic run of the mill engine. Um, a turbo, does anybody know how a turbo works? Sam? It uses the, the exhaust to spin a fan in the sex and air. Exactly, exactly. So a turbo um, is yeah. kind of neat. Okay, so this is the turbo. Mounts to the intake. All your intake comes from here. Exhaust comes through here. So as the exhaust leaves, there's a big fan in here. I say big fan, it's about this big. The exhaust spins that fan, which then spins a fan on this side. And that then builds pressure and blows air through the intake into the car. So all we're doing is forcing air in. It's not magic, it's nothing special. We're spinning a fan with exhaust that's already coming out of the car and that is giving us an output. What benefits might we have for more air? Fuel economy. Fuel economy, more fuel. Power. Power. Um, what downsides, downside might there be to a turbo? Car weight. Yep. Uh, your car gets more, your engine gets more wear. Yeah, you're gonna wear your engine out faster, but that's just because you're out having a good time. That's your own fault. You can run a turbo properly forever, and it won't wear your engine out, but nobody's gonna do that. That's not what turbos are meant for. Um, when does a turbo perform? Low speeds? Lower speeds. Aiden. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, it makes the car less reliable. Does it? Sometimes. Does it? Uh, so a turbo, we actually get our power at higher speeds or higher RPM. So if you think about it, you need to first spool up that turbo, which is the term that we use, uh, and that needs to spin that wheel. So in order for that to happen, we need to put exhaust through it. In order to put exhaust through it, we need to already be driving. So um, you'll hear the term turbo lag. When people are talking about cars and they have turbo lag on the highway, you're cruising, you go to pass somebody, and, and then it's gone. You get that little turbo leg initially 
um, before it really takes off. And that's because it takes a little bit of time to build that pressure. Um, a supercharger, on the other hand, mounts right on top of the intake and runs off the belt. So it's got basically two shafts um, that are like spiral shafts and they spin inside and they're, it's almost like a vein pump if you guys are familiar. I don't know why you would be familiar with a vein pump. Uh, but they basically mesh together, forcing air through. So it's almost like two fans um, that are running off of one pulley. And that forces the intake air the air in and it's doing it all the time. So a supercharger, you're getting a lot more right off the line because it's working right away. Uh, but as soon as you hit RPM, high RPM, that supercharger is spinning so fast that it's actually putting through more air than it can bring in and you kind of lose that power band. So at high RPMs, you start to sort of lose power, whereas a turbo, you're going to get the power at the high end. So um, the constant argument of what's better, supercharger or turbo, depends on what you want. You want something off the line, you want a supercharger. Yeah? Didn't the Lancia Delta have both? Yeah. In Maui? So Possibly. It switched off. Yeah. It would go faster. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but that would make sense. And they don't interfere with each other at all. So you can run both. Um, then with the supercharger, you've got that bottom end power and you've got the turbo power at the top end. Gordon? What does 10 to 1 compression mean? What does 10 to 1 compression mean? Well, weren't you listening when I explained it earlier, Gordon? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, 10 to 1 compression would be, let me show you. <laughs> Let's go back 300 slides here. Okay, so this for example is a compression of nine to one. So when the cylinder is at bottom dead center, we have 80 cc's of stroke space and 10 cc's of uh, combustion chamber volume. So for a total of 90 cc's. Now we have 10 cc's is combustion chamber. So that gives us 90 to 10, which is a nine to one compression. Okay, so the basically what it is, it's overall volume in compared to combustion chamber volume. Um, it's really never that simple because that's never 80 cc's, that's 83 cc's and, and that's 12 and a half cc and your compression's 8.36 to one. Uh, but for simplicity, that's how you find compression ratio. Does anybody else want to know anything? Does anybody else care? Are you guys tired of listening to me? Hayden? Uh, what's a full bolt on? What's that? A uh, full bolt on. I don't even know what you're asking me. Like, uh, the car is full bolt on. I don't full know what that bolt. means. Full bolt on, like, what makes a car full bolt on? Full bolt ons? Yeah, well, like somebody saw in a race car. Yeah. And they say it's full, in their Kijiji ad, I have a 2003 Subaru full bolt on. So, there's a reason why I don't really understand that, and that's because that's something that big people talk about. Um, Full bolt-on would just refer to, I bought everything Canadian Tire had to offer and I bolted it onto this car. So basically, you've done all the upgrades you can do without doing any real work. You've maybe bolted on a turbo, but you haven't tweaked, tuned, tuned the computers, or you've bolted on a supercharger, you haven't upgraded the injectors, you've never pulled the heads off the engine, you haven't done any internal work, you've only done external work, bolt-on. Essentially, anything that we can bolt on, we've done, uh, but we haven't done anything to this car to actually improve its performance. Anything else? No. Do you guys want to pull down some of these engines? We're going to find some space to work on them. Uh, we've got to get oil in them, and we've got to get some fuel in them. I'd like to get them running today, and then we can be ready to tear them down on Monday. So, Mr. Maloney is going to partner you guys up. I recommend that you pick a partner, if Maloney lets you pick a partner, that is reliable for attendance, because you're going to want two of you working on this. So if your buddy doesn't show up to class, don't be his buddy for this project. Okay, this is going to be a, a two-person job, and it's going to be nice to have somebody working through it with you. So Mr. Maloney will take a second and put you guys in groups or let you pick your groups. And we'll okay, whenever you're ready, man. We're good. Okay, so we're going to learn to gap a spark plug. 
What we're gapping is the space between the electrodes in here. Okay, these ones spec should be 30 thou. We use, this is a spark plug gapper. It's a coin style gapper. We have, it's basically just a general wedge all the way around the outside. And you can see all the number readings on the top. I think you guys have seen these already once. But what we're gonna do is we just start on the end and just gently work your way around and wherever it stops. So in this case, these are already set to exactly 30 thou. If for example, if for example it was not at 30 thou, okay, at 20 thou, we can then open this up with the back side of this coin until we see what we want. And in this case, we can go way beyond. If it's too big. Is that spark plug yet? Yeah. So we're just gonna turn this down. We're at 43. And just little increments. You don't want to do it too big or you'll collapse it. Or if you open it too much, you'll break off the electrode. We'll just work our way back down to 30 thou. Just like that. And then you know you're good. Now in this style plug, this is like a platinum plug, so you can do that. There are other plugs which are iridium plugs. They're very narrow tip on the end, and if you use this style and wiggle it through like I was doing, you'll actually break them off. So you would then just make it your right size and you're only gonna slide in to check. You're not actually going to wiggle it along as you go. So that is your basic setup for a spark plug. There are two different types of gappers. There's also a, like a wire gapper where there's six different sized wires on it, and you just slide them in. Uh, but this is quick, it's easy, it's very common, it's cheap. And that is how you spark, spark? That is how you spark a gap plug. That's how you gap a spark plug. Okay, Malone, I'm done.